Hey guys, it's Jasper, and today I'm going to be doing a book review of Robert Kirk's The Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fawns, and Fairies. Overall, I think it was a, it was a good read. It was something I was happy to have read. I was a little bit disappointed, um, but I think that's because The Little Mermaid and I have a lot in common, being that I always want more. I want more. I want to be where the fairies are. I want to see, see them dancing, walking along, stealing people's souls. I don't know. Um. <laughs> Anyways, so there was a lot of hype around this book, at least a lot of hype in a sort of academic way. Robert Kirk is a pretty big name when it comes to fairy mythology, especially within the um, the Celtic world. So I was really looking forward to this book and I was kind of just expecting a little bit more out of it. That's not to say it wasn't an excellent book. Again, I just, I just am always wanting more, more, more. Robert Kirk was a minister during the 1600s and one of his main um, purposes or goals was to show how belief in the fairy, belief in the fairies in general didn't necessarily have to conflict with Christian belief. If you watched my last video where I discuss Lizanne Henderson and Edward J. Cohen's Scottish fairy belief, um, then you'll remember me talking about the witch trials and the demonization of fairy belief. And so Robert Kirk would have been somebody who was trying to fight against this demonization and further show that it didn't necessarily conflict with Christianity. Something interesting about the secret commonwealth in terms of its publishing history, which is kind of neat, I want to read for you guys. Um, Kirk was working on this book in the 1680s and he died before he was able to publish it. Um, a result of his death before being able to publish it, and especially because it was a work that investigated the fairies, there was a, or not, there wasn't a rumor, there was lots of rumors that Kirk was investigating things he shouldn't have because there's lots of folk stories about people who are putting their nose into the business of the fairies and then the fairies come and take them away. And so it was rumored that Kirk didn't die before being able to publish the book, but the fairies took him away before he could publish it. So he was working on the book in the 1680s and it was first published then, not until the, uh, till 1893, by Andrew Lang who provided an introduction. And this copy has got the 1893 introduction by Andrew Lang. And it also has an introduction by R.B. Cunningham Graham that was produced in 1933. And again, this is, or maybe I didn't say, this is a 2008 edition. So the book has a very interesting history, being that it was something started in the 1680s, didn't get published because Kirk was uh, swept away by the fairies or, or passed away. And then not till 1893 was it published and with a foreword by Andrew Lang. And then 1933 published again with an introduction by R.B. Cunningham Graham. And then 2008 Dover has put out this lovely edition. So the first introduction by R.B. Cunningham Graham I really, really enjoyed. I wanted to share with you guys just one of the things that he says about Robert Kirk because, um, yeah, it just speaks to the, the rumored fairy belief around uh, Kirk, and it's kind of interesting. So he says, It may well be the Reverend Mr. Kirk was but a changeling from his birth. A leprechaun, I think they call it, in the dialect of Erse, spoken in Ireland and sent on earth as an ambassador from the secret commonwealth of elves and fairies to make their ways and customs manifest to us, the grosser mortals, nurtured on beef and bros. That is one hypothesis largely discounted. I must admit, by his knowledge of the classics and his sacred calling for the good people, could but not have spoken Gaelic or perhaps Pictish. And certainly, as Andrew Lang says in his verses, none of them could have kent the covenant to works fray that of grace. So perhaps, after all, the writer of this most curious book was but a mortal, mystical by nature, with his mysticism sublimated, sublimated in the crucible of the Vale of Aberfall. Even to this day, in the half-light of autumn evenings, the Vale takes on, once more, an air of an older world. So maybe that is lovely to me and it means nothing to you. 
can I read? I'm gonna read. Can I read? This is my blog, and I'll do as I please because I don't really have anybody watching me, anyways. Um, I just wanted to read how he ends it because it's because it's really really sweet. Um, happier by far he must be with those green clad little folk who know no care, no envy, malice, hatred, or uncharitableness, and are always glad. Um, yeah, so I really, really enjoyed the first introduction by Graham. The introduction by Andrew Lang, I was sad to say I didn't really enjoy that much. I actually was like, come on, Lang. This is like fairy belief. This is Robert Kirk. Like, you know, um, why can't, why can't I keep interested? I just found, and I feel awful saying this, but I just found Lang to be really boring in this introduction. And I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I just wasn't in the right mindset, but I, I will, because I read the end of uh, Graham and, and how Graham ends his introduction, I wanted to read to you how um, Andrew Lang ends it because I did underline a portion. And maybe I just underlined it because it was finally the end, but um, there's something there. And so I'll share that with you just to give you, again, a taste of what these introductions are like. As to the fairy belief, we conceive it to be a complex matter from which tradition with its memory of earth dwellers is not wholly absent, while more is due to a survival of the pre-Christian Hades and to the belief in local spirits, the views of Melissena, the Nereids of ancient and modern Greece, the Laris of Rome, the fateful More of Hathras, old imaginings of a world not yet dispeopled of its dreams. And that last portion is a, um, a quote, the dispeopled of its dreams. Um, the one thing that both of the introductions do a really great job of emphasizing is the, the fairy nature of Robert Kirk and the fairy nature of Scotland itself. Um, that the Celtic fairy belief is based in the landscape that it takes place in. And I think that's something that makes the Celtic folklore so unique and so interesting and something that I love so much about it. Something that's making me so hungry and excited to be getting to go to Scotland um, soon is the plan. But um, that the belief is, is deep seated in, in the, you know, the Scottish Highlands, in the, in the Lowlands, in the Isle of Skye, in the weather and how quickly it can change and its mood and, and all of that stuff. In terms of Robert Kirk's portion of the book, largely Robert Kirk talks a lot about fairy belief in general, where we believe the fairies to live, how we believe they interact with humans. They talk a lot about, you know, how to keep safe from fairies, a lot which involves uh, people, especially women or women who are expecting babies because this is a dangerous spot for a woman to be, putting um, iron under her bed or a oh, loaf of bread because the bread is the body of Christ. Um, and there's something else which I can't remember. So if you're trying to ward off fairies, I guess you'll have to use a, uh, a stick or a lump of iron or a piece of bread because I I can't remember what the other thing was. But of course, the reason why it was more dangerous for women who were pregnant was, um, who were pregnant or just about to give birth, was because if you are just about to give birth, the fairies might come and quickly uh, swap your baby for that of a changeling baby, which will just wither and be cranky and awful. Um, or they might take away the new mother because um, often the fairies, you know, they've got a lot of babies that they've swapped for changelings and they need somebody to breastfeed the babies or just, you know, feeding their own kind and that sort of thing. So often cows and new moms are taken for, for breastfeeding the babies that the fairies have stolen. It's like a weird nursery situation they have going on. The thing that I love the most about this book and again, it has got a lot of great worth in terms of words, uh, in terms of words. Imagine a book being good in terms of words. 
My, did you get a master's degree to come up with such criticism? The thing that I loved the most about this book was the beautiful, beautiful illustrations. See here. Oh, I think this is my favorite. I'm pretty sure. Stunner. Um, and let me just look up really quick. The illustrations were done by H.J. Ford. These beautiful illustrations. Oh, 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 oh. Isn't that nice? So the illustrations are beautiful. Overall, it's a fairly quick read. Again, it took me about a week, and by that I mean obviously I wasn't committed to it. If you were to sit down, you could read this in a day. Um, I would suggest maybe reading it over two days or three days, just because there is quite a bit, and you have three different uh, voices, because you have the first introduction by Graham, the second by Lang, and then the actual text itself um, by Kirk. So to sort of space it out for that reason alone would be a good thing, but fairly easy book to read. It's a, it's a good, very basic starting point for belief in the fairies, and if you haven't read um, this and you are interested in fairy criticism, especially Celtic, this is a great place to start. And yeah, so... We did it! Or I did it! I don't know. So the next book I am going to be reading is... La -da! There we go. This is The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, the classic study of leprechauns, pixies, and other fairy spirits by W.Y. Evan Wentz. Um, this is a book that's been on my TBR for a while, and I'm excited about reading. Um, a little excerpt on the back. The world is not only stranger than we suppose, it is stranger than we can suppose. J.B.S. Halden. That's a really poor accent, so I hope you enjoyed that. Or, um, we're not offended by it, so... Ah. <laughs> So his work, um, Evan Wendt's work, is similar to Kirk's work in the way that it's looking at um, the fairy belief and saying, you know, this is something that is real. It um, is, again, it's another work that's at the very basic of if you are interested in doing any sort of research or work within fairy culture and the Celtic, uh, the Celtic world, this is a great book to be starting with. I will let you know when I am through this book because it is a hefty book of talking about fairies for like 500 pages. So wish me luck. See you guys next time. And fairies. Ah!